there is becoming an ever more popular argument between which is a better system, mirrorless or DSLR. And one of the big arguments that pro DSLR people put out is the fact that mirrorless lenses aren't actually that much smaller than a DSLR. So you're not really gaining anything in a size or weight saving by switching over to mirrorless. But is this true? Partially. There's a few different levels to this argument, so let's begin to break them down. Firstly, what is the supposed benefit of a mirrorless system? In a DSLR, you have the sensor, you have a mirror, and then you have the mount for the lens. Now, because of the mirror being there, the sensor has to be placed back from the mount. So any lens designed for a DSLR has to be designed in such a way that the image that it projects out of the back of the lens becomes perfectly in focus exactly the right distance away from the lens. This is known as the flange distance and in most DSLRs that distance is 44 millimeters. Now in mirrorless systems, by removing that mirror, it means that the sensor can be brought closer to the lens mount. So the flange distance has reduced from 44 millimeters down to about 18 millimeters. So the supposed benefit of doing this is that by reducing the flange distance, the lens doesn't have to project the image as far, so it doesn't have to be as complicated a design and the whole size of the lens can be shrunk down. Thus meaning that not only is the body smaller and lighter, but the lenses are smaller and lighter, meaning that a mirrorless system on paper should be a lot smaller and a lot lighter than an equivalent DSLR. But this isn't always the case. Smaller flange distances can only really be made use of in any lens that has a wide angle, because the way the lens has to be designed, the way the image is projected, suits a shorter flange distance. However, longer focal length lenses don't work that way. You have to have that extra length in order for the lens to be able to project the image properly. There was a recent interview with the CEO of Sigma, Kazuto Yamaki, where he was discussing Sigma's plans for the new Sony E-mount lenses and where they are going to go in the future. When asked would Sigma be creating new lenses solely for the Sony E-mount, he started talking about the flange distance and how it affects the lens design. Basically, around about 35 millimeters is the cutoff point for a shorter flange distance being a benefit. So any lens with a focal length wider than 35 millimeters can be made quite a lot smaller by having that shorter flange distance. Once you go beyond 35 millimeters, that flange distance kind of becomes irrelevant. So a lot of the lenses that you see from Sony, that you will notice there is a large spacing element on the back of the lens barrel because essentially the lens has to be forced away that same sort of 44 millimeters from the sensor that you find in a DSLR. However, some of the lenses where they cross over either side of a 35 millimeter, you might see some benefit. Plus, mirrorless opens up options for wide-angle lenses that just are not possible on a DSLR. You only have to look at Venus Optics with their lower lenses for this. They've recently released two interesting new lenses solely for mirrorless cameras. The first is a 9mm f2.8 for APS-C, and it is about the size of a shot glass. The second most interesting one is a 15mm f2. Now what makes this lens interesting isn't the focal length or the aperture. Sigma have already made a 14mm f1.8 for DSLRs. It's just the sheer size of the thing. There's quite a lot of 14mm f2.8 primes for DSLRs on the market. Now all of these are a stop slower than the Lauer 15mm, but none of them have the ability to take front filters because they've had to have this large bulbous front element. Whereas with the Lauer, because it can be designed solely for mirrorless cameras, it's been able to be made a lot smaller. It can take normal screw on front filters, which is something you just cannot get from DSLRs. So with wide angles, mirrorless lenses can be made a lot smaller and a lot lighter, which is gonna suit travel photographers quite a bit. For longer focal lengths, there's really not that much of a change. So sports and wildlife photographers, it won't be that appealing to you. But there is another aspect to consider when we're talking about the size of lenses, and that's the performance of the lens. The size of a lens is dictated by three important factors. Firstly, the focal length. So the longer you make the focal length of a lens, the bigger you have to make the lens. 
Secondly, the aperture. So the bigger you make the aperture, the wider the lens has to be. So the bigger the lens has to be overall as well. But thirdly, the image performance. So by making a lens bigger, it allows manufacturers more flexibility and more control over being able to kind of manipulate the light the way that they want, which is going to affect the image sharpness that you see. It's also going to affect the vignetting and the distortion. So sometimes manufacturers will make a lens bigger than it really needs to be in order to maximize the performance. In that same interview with Sigma's CEO, he was asked how did they make the decision between choosing between great optical performance at the cost of size and weight or keeping the lens smaller and lighter and potentially affecting image quality. His personal response was that basically image quality is paramount at whatever size and weight the lens needs to be. Case in point, Canon recently released the 85mm. It's got a 77mm front filter thread and put onto a kind of medium to large size DSLR. It kind of fits pretty well. Compare that to the Sigma 85mm art lens. Now, technical specifications, this is exactly the same as the Canon, so it really should be the same size. In fact, it should be smaller because this doesn't have image stabilization, but it's not. It's huge, it's a lot, lot bigger. It has a 86 millimeter front filter thread by comparison. Why? Because optically, this thing is a lot sharper than the Canon because Sigma have designed this to be as optically good as it can be, whereas Canon have clearly compromised in order to try and keep the size and weight down. So you compare up the mirrorless to DSLRs and you see sometimes there's no difference. For example, the 70 to 200, the 100 to 400 from Sony are all the same size as the Canons. But also bear in mind, they are the Sony G Master lenses, which means they need to be as optically as good as they can be. Sony aren't going to compromise their flagship lenses to make them smaller and lighter to suit a mirrorless system. They want them to be as tack sharp as possible. Some of their other lenses, however, the kind of smaller 1.8 Zeiss lenses are clearly a lot smaller and a lot lighter and would suit a lot better to somebody who wants a small lightweight kit. So ultimately in the discussion of which is better, mirrorless or DSLRs, the answer is the same as always, whatever suits you best. Just because somebody else prefers a DSLR doesn't mean the DSLRs are better. Just because somebody prefers a mirrorless system doesn't mean mirrorless are better. All it means is that mirrorless suits one person better, DSLR might suit somebody else better. Really, you have to decide what are you looking for in a camera and which fills those needs best. So that's it for another video. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and make sure you turn on the little notification so that you know when my next video goes live. And hopefully, I'll see you there.